was definitely in the land. I was excited. I think probably the most excited I got on my whole trip was when I got on the airplane from Memphis to Newark because I was sitting there in that little airplane and we were taking off and I thought, God, I'm going to Israel. I'm really going to Israel. And it was until we set foot in Tel Aviv and had to go through all the passport checks and stuff there, it wasn't until we actually got there that I realized I was actually there. But I tell you what, I, I want to say there were highlights, highlights. You cannot imagine what it's like and there's so much to see that it's impossible to see it all in one trip. So suffice it to say I'm going back and when I go back I would like to take all of you that want to go. And I want to tell you right now that God is well able to provide the way for you. Highlights of the trip, I think the first that I would consider a real highlight was when we were on the Sea of Galilee. Now it was exciting to me when we got on the boat and, and started heading out that a, one of the staff guys on the boat raised the American flag and, we, and played um, the Star Spangled Banner and we all sang. And then he raised the Israeli flag and those of, no, those of us who knew that sang that, I don't know it yet. But th that was a very touching moment. And then as things settled down while we were in that boat, all of a sudden I realized this is the same body of water that Jesus walked on. This is the same body of water that Peter stepped out of that boat and walked on and I'm floating in a boat on that same body of water. He could have walked right where we were. You know, because he started somewhere and went out to where the boat was. So that, that was exciting to me. Another exciting place, or not exciting, but powerful, was when we went into the place where they say that Jesus, after he'd been beaten, he was thrown into a cistern. And actually they've cleaned it out now, so we went all the way down into it. And when they threw him into that thing, they didn't throw him into that pretty little spot that we da went down into. Because in the cisterns, the, all the water was gathered there. And as it sat in the cistern, then all the gunk dropped to the bottom. So he was thrown down into that with all that garbage there for us. For us. And our, our tour guides say, I have one very short prayer whenever I come in here. Thank you, Jesus. And I must say that that, that very well said it. Um, another thing that I found extremely exciting was when we went to Capernaum. And uh, that was the seat of Jesus' ministry. That was his headquarters. And at one point, he took us there. They have a place there where they've got remains of Peter's house. Simon Peter, the fisherman who was not an, uh, a poor man. None of these fishermen were poor. That was a very, a very um, profitable, lucrative business that they were in. But his place is over here. Over here they had their local temple, synagogue, whatever they called it. And between Peter's house and that, there's this little bitty road. It's probably about this wide, maybe. And that's the place where, as Jesus was running, because Jairus' daughter was dead, he was running there to raise that girl from the dead, that's where the woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus and was made every whit hall. And he knew that virtue had come out of him. And when you see the size of that little road, it makes it a whole lot different. I mean, uh, of course his disciples said, well, Jesus, they're pressed all around you. What do you mean somebody touched you? And I could understand that when we went into old, the old city, old Jerusalem, into the... Um, marketplace man that was uh, actually what we were told to do when we went there we said okay watch where you're going because if you don't watch where you're going you will fall because it's very uneven and they said stay close together there are thieves around here so instead of enjoying the shops which we got plenty of opportunities to shop but instead of enjoying that we were all looking at our feet and we had our hand on the shoulder of the other person not one of us wanted to be separated I mean, that, that was a press. They were all around. There was barely room to get through. Now, that was, that was interesting. I thought, well, here we are. We've gone to 
old Jerusalem down the streets of the thing there and all we've seen is the path. But we did get to eat there so we, we did at least get to sit down and see some stuff. That was interesting to me because of the press. I connected it with that little street where the woman with the issue of blood was healed. And, and I was moved... The last day that we were there, we went to the to the temple, to the ruins of the temple where Jesus did a lot of his teaching on the steps of the temple. They have, I mean, of course it's all, you know, I mean it's ruins. But the corner of that temple, the pinnacle of that temple where we were was where the devil took Jesus and said, hey, if you'll throw yourself down off of here, I'll, I'll give it all to you. And we were right there where that temptation happened. Not up at the top, but down here. That was interesting to me. And in that particular wall, over on this side, there's three entrance ways. Over on the other side, there is one exit way, exit gate. And um, there's still some of the original. Now, they've built up some things, but there's still some of the original stones there. So over at this gate, where the exit was, now, I found it very interesting when our guide said people, the only people that would ever go in that exit gates were the ones that were bringing their sin offerings. That they had to go against the flow and everybody knew that they were going against the flow because they were bad and they had to go get it taken care of. And so the other people all went in the little three-door side over here and came through with their offering and then exited that one door. So we were able to go step on a stone that Jesus probably stepped on as he walked out that door, the gate. I found that interesting. Um, we prayed along the way. I enjoyed going to Megiddo. We went um, there. I don't know all the history. I couldn't catch everything our tour guide was saying, but I do know one thing, that they had a supply of water. Well, there's a cistern way down in the, in, in the ground. And we had the opportunity, if we wanted to, to walk down to that. It's something like 183 steps going down. And it's very, almost vertical. And then when we got there, there's this little cistern with this little bit of water in it. And so he says, you know how valuable this was. Because they would come all the way down here and get it and bring it out by small containers. And then we got to walk back up out of that and it was almost a hundred steps and it felt like it was almost straight up. I so thoroughly enjoyed, there's um, at Shiloh, actually they call it Shiloh. And uh, then you've also got, it was Eli, Eli, instead of Eli, Eli. This is, this is the very place where Eli was the, the priest and his sons were bad dudes and Hannah prayed for Samuel. And we got to walk right there in the midst of that current active archaeological site. And an interesting thing there to me is that in the word they were commanded to go every year at a specific time to the temple. Well actually what it says is go to where you can see it. Because it's really a small area, actually, where they could come. The little place would not be big enough for several million Jews to congregate all at once. So they would come to the point in the mountains there where they could see the temple. And that was as far as they had to come. Well, from the furthest point away that you can see the temple, all the way to the temple and in the grounds, there are pot pottery shards. When you get to the point where you can't see it anymore, all of that doesn't happen anymore. So instead of them throwing away their plastic bottles and their plastic bags and stuff, they just threw away their pottery when they got through with their meals. And we got the privilege of just picking up some of that. And I'll bring you some next week if you're interested so that you can have a prayer focus point. Now I want you to turn, that's what I'm going to tell you about Israel, except the journey getting there. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark 9. Verse 17, I really, what I really want to talk to you about today is faith. Faith. 
And one of the multitude answered him and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him. And he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus saith, said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. I want you to focus on, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe. And Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I have, through the years, done my best to build my confidence in the Lord. To be willing to believe in the impossible. On July 2nd last year, at the End Time Handmaidens and Servants Convention, after we'd had our opening night speaker, who is a missionary to China, our world president, Sharon, stood up. And she said, I feel like there are many of you in this room that God's called to go to China and you haven't done it yet. Will you raise your hand if that's you? And a lot of people raised their hands. And a lot of people, then she said, okay, if God's called you and you haven't gone yet, come up here. We're going to pray for you. And they went up there and I stood at my chair. I wasn't gripping it. It wasn't one of those things like salvation, you know, where you hold on like that's for dear life. I just stood there and I thought, well, God, I can honestly say in my heart that I believe that you've never asked me to go to China. But if you want me to go somewhere, I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go. Whew. When I said that, he spoke to my heart. He said, get your passport ready and go to Israel with the handmaidens next time they go. I said, okay. So that, that still affects me the same way it did then because it was, it was a strong thing. In April of last year, at the last, the last um, meeting of the branch officers' convocation for headquarters, when our president was speaking to us, she was talking, they had just gotten back from a missions trip to China and then they'd gone to Israel and, and so she was sharing some about that. When I talked with Steve that night, he said, you need to get your passport ready and you need to go with them next time they go. So see, that was from April, I think it was April 15th to July 2nd. Steve believed it before I did. God spoke to him first. And... Um, by the time I got home after he'd told me that, he had paperwork out and stuff. He'd even dug out my expired passport. And I kind of looked at it and, and just let it go until after convention. And so I get back home and I get on the internet and I start looking at, at, at uh, what all's involved besides getting that passport ready. And I made a note to myself mid-August and I said... I have been dragging my feet because this costs a lot of money and I don't have that money. And so I haven't been doing anything. Well, let me back up the night that, that God spoke to me to go. I shared it with Sharon after the meeting. She said, well, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. And I said, 
yeah, I believe that. I believe it's his will and we sure will need him to pay for it. So, here I am mid-August. And I haven't done anything except dilly-dally around. And then I was walking one day with my buddy and she stopped to stretch because I was late getting there. So I kept walking and I'm talking to the Lord about it again. And I can remember the spot on our little track we walk on where he spoke to me and he said, You are walking in disobedience rooted in unbelief. And uh, that was hard. I knew it was true. I knew it was true. So I say with this guy, Lord, help my unbelief. So at that point, I decided I just need to do the next thing. So Steve and I got my passport application ready. And we got that. Um, I think it was very significant that the day it will expire will be our anniversary in, 2000, in, in 2023. That it would be our anniversary. I thought when it came back, I thought, God, only you could have done that because it was August when I sent it in. But I thought, yeah, you want me to know that I've got your stamp of approval. Well, along the way, the money kept coming in from different sources. Different people would give me money. I'll tell you this, I did not advertise. I refused. As a matter of fact, y'all didn't know I was going until this year sometime when, when all the money was in. Because I didn't want to be manipulating anybody into doing this. If it's God's will, it's God's bill, and he'll take care of it. At one point, I thought, well, God, you know, I could get a job. I do know how to do some things. And it was almost like he very adamantly spoke to me and said, no, you're doing my work. And I thought, yeah, if I do something else, then I won't be free to go do the things that you want me to do when you want me to do, including my trip to, to uh, Tulsa in January when my sister got saved. I wouldn't have been able to do that more than likely if I'd been working for somebody else. I wouldn't be able to go to the nursing homes when I go if I were working for somebody else. I wouldn't be able to go wherever God says to go for whatever purpose if I were working for somebody else. So I accepted that. Well, we were getting close to the end of the year. I finally, finally, finally sent in my deposit and uh, getting near the end of the year and we were still like a thousand dollars off and, and I, I kept saying to Steve, well, I believe God's going to provide that by the end of the year. And we're talking, you know, six months from the time he spoke to me. And it still wasn't there. And um, right at the end of the year, I was at, I was under $200 toward the goal of what I needed just for the expense of getting there and doing all the stuff. Not the spending money, just getting there. So um, on the last Saturday of the month at, at, Claudia's at our prayer meeting I was telling him well I still believe God's going to provide all of it by the end of the year you know he's done all this why wouldn't he well that afternoon I got home and a buddy of mine called for something else and we got towards the end of our conversation she said well well how's your expense money how's your Israel money coming I said well I'm under two hundred dollars oh I'll give that to you so before the end of the year I had the commitment that it would be done now it was January 2nd when I went and received the money from her exactly six months from the day that God told me to go and I tell you what my belief my, my faith level rose through that it's no big deal I tell you folks I've, I struggled with it and I, I think well God why am I struggling with this in 2002 you gave both of us brand new PT cruisers and the insurance for a year. Why am I struggling with this, God? I know that, that $5,000 is no thing for you. I mean, you gave us almost 50000 for the cars. Why is it so hard? And he said, that was open-ended. When you began believing me for it and you began sowing seeds, it was, well, it'll happen one day. And it was like 14 months after we sowed the first seed that we had our cars in our driveway. So I knew that God could do it. And I said, well, God, one of our ladies in, in our Saturday group, she's all, God spoke to her one day and he said, I surpass time and space. So to him, providing money for that trip and providing money for the cars, it was the same thing. There was no time and space limitations for him. But I want you to understand, have faith in God. We can trust him implicitly. 
If he tells you to do something, just do it. I, I know one of our, um, it's not really a catchphrase, it's just where we are right now in the handmaidens and servants is whatever God tells you to do, just do it. You know, don't try to figure it all out. I want to tell you that I believe that like this father whose child ended up being delivered that day and set free, I'm sure that that man's faith rose several notches. And I, my faith has risen several notches because God provided and because he's grown me. And I don't ever, 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 ever want to hear him say to me, daughter, you are walking in disobedience rooted in unbelief. I don't ever want to hear him say that to me again. He, if he cares for the, the lilies, you know, how about that sparrow? How about the hair that fell off your head? I mean, we're talking about a detail-oriented God. And he's also the God. There is only one God. He is the God, and he created all of this. Why should I worry? Why should I worry? I shouldn't. That's what I have to say about that. In Matthew 19, 26, when Jesus was telling the, the disciples that it's easier for, an eye, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it was for a rich man to be saved, they were shocked and wanted to know who could be saved. And Jesus said, with men this is impossible, but all things are possible with God. That's what I want you to get from that scripture. All things are possible with God. The things that you think are so hard that they never could happen, they're possible with God. And I'll tell you, according to what God told my other friend Brenda Hobson, Omega has already signed out off on what Alpha has ordered in your life. Don't worry about it. All we have to do, Jason, is just do the next thing. Just do the next thing. Whatever God tells you to do, if it's a big thing or it's a little thing. And I'm serious about going back. And I'm serious about taking everyone with me that wants to go. Because the same God who provided for me will provide for you. If he wants you to go, it's his bill. Our last morning devotional that we had, it was, it was written as if Jesus were speaking to us. And I'm sure he was because it was written by a woman who wrote many devotionals where Jesus was speaking to us. He said, I invited you to come home. And you came. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. And I, I want you all to understand Israel is very much just like here. There are contrasts in peoples. There are contrasts in deserts and lush lands. There are contrasts in all kinds of stuff just like here. The sun shines bright. We didn't see any rain, just a little sprinkle. We were blessed with that. But it's also a land rich with our heritage. I had forgotten until after it was all paid for and I was getting ready to go that there were times in my life when I tried to go by my, tried to make it work myself. Two different times. One time I was even going to go with a different group and I went so far as to send in a deposit and I don't remember why I couldn't go, but I couldn't. And I don't know. I don't remember all of it. I just know that I was going to go with them and I didn't get to go. And they sent my deposit back. That was nice of them. And then there was one time after I'd been away from handmaidens and servants for a season and I came back and I began when I went to convention I was helping in the bookstore so I just began making things and selling them to get together the money to go. Well without going into a lot of details that didn't work. I probably got a couple of thousand at the most over all my several years of working at that. You know, you put money back into it to make more things to sell, and I wasn't getting much out of the conventions. But it just came to the place where I said, hey, this is not going to work, and I quit trying. And I, I just put it out of my mind until last year when Steve said, you need to get your passport ready and you need to go with them next time they go. 
I want to encourage you, whatever God tells you to do, he will make it comfortable for you. It may be a stretch getting there, but he will make it work. I feel like I need to share one more thing about actually walking in Israel. We walked and we walked and we walked and we walked and we walked up and down, round and through, up and down. So, if you really want to go with me, next time I go, start your exercising now. I was very thankful that I had been walking on a regular basis for several years. That could have been why I didn't get to go the other times, you know, because there, there were those among us who did not get to do everything because they just simply did not have the stamina to walk. I had another little bonus while I was there. God healed me of claustrophobia. And that's a good thing because on the bus, on the bus, on the plane ride back, I was sitting in a window seat in a back corner next to the bathrooms. Actually, Steve worried about me that whole night. I told him even when we were taking off, I was asleep. I was so exhausted by the time we got there. I was zonked out by the time we were taking off. And that's a miracle, you know. Anybody taking off on a humongous jet like that and you're sleeping through it, you've got to know God's peace is on you. But I tell you what, you will, I, I believe that God did that miracle for me because I'm going to be in positions where I won't be able to protect myself from those closed-in spaces. And he doesn't want me uncomfortable. <laughs> but it's whatever you need. Whatever you need, trust God. Have faith in God. When I got home, I was sick. After I got home, I mean, I was good the whole time I was there. But it's like, God, I told Jason I would share the Sunday I get back, and I'm going to do it, sick or well. And on the way over here, I thought, well, you're still the healing Jesus. And I stand before you. My nose hadn't dripped once. So there you go. He took care of it. And I'm able to talk. I'm not coughing. But I refuse to settle. I refuse to settle. I refuse to settle. And I encourage you, refuse to settle. If something does come on you, fight it. I have another friend who says, just don't sign for it. So just don't sign for it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Have faith in God. It's impossible to please God without faith. Now faith. Now faith. My faith from yesterday doesn't count. Except as, as it has built my, my, uh, up my faith for today. But what I believed for yesterday, I got to go beyond that. Today's a good day to stretch. Father, have your way. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that each one who hears this message would be challenged to step up to a new level of faith, Lord. Because Jesus, you said all things are possible with God. You told us in one place, only believe. You said if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And it would go. You said, have faith in God. Lord, teach us how to have faith in you. I thank you that all things are possible with God. I thank you that... Those who come to you must believe that you are and that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. I thank you that you desire to give us the desires of our hearts. I thank you that you exceed the need. You are able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to your power that works in us. I ask, Lord God, that each one of us this day would shake off unbelief. That none of us would have to hear you ever say you're walking in disobedience rooted in unbelief. Help us with each step we take to have more faith in you. Help us to put our confidence and hope and trust in you. Regardless of what we see. And we will give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus name. Amen. If you want prayer I'd love to pray for you.